Middle Tennessee Blue Raiders head coach Nick McDevitt joins Marching to Madness. The Blue Raiders won the regular season championship last year in the CU in the Conference USA Eastern Division. They won three games in the CBI before a tough double overtime loss to UNC Wellington in a championship game. Currently, Middle Tennessee is six and five inside Conference USA as Florida Atlantic now continues to lead the league with an 11-0 mark. The Blue Raiders, though, are only two games off second place inside the league. Coach, welcome back. Good to see you. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Oh, yeah. Hey, your program kind of took off last year with those 26 wins and, uh, you know, the CUSA East title with the CBI run getting alphabetic this morning. Overall, uh, talk about how the squad was able to move forward two, two years pretty much of COVID and then have what is now becoming two seasons after, two strong seasons afterward. Yeah, we, we were uh, fortunate really just to get the locker room right. And I mean that to say that uh, we lost a couple of players from the year before and the, the uh, new players on last year's team just messed really well uh, with our returning players. Uh, We kind of could sense over that summer that uh, the feel in our workouts and our uh, off-court training uh, just felt a little bit different. It seemed like the the leadership, the buy-in was a little bit uh, stronger than what it had been. But we'd also, we we were just a little bit uh, bigger, and longer and more athletic than we had been. Uh, I've always liked being able to play uh, deeper into the bench than we were able to over the first couple of years here in our time at middle. And then last year, uh, we we felt like uh, we were deep at nine or t- at the ninth and 10th players were, uh, there wasn't a real big difference between one and two and nine and 10. And That's so <laughs> we, we changed a couple things up uh, defensively. Uh, and offensively that allowed us to play a little more up-tempo than we had been. And, uh, you know, this year's uh, very similar. We're still pretty long and athletic and uh, able to play fairly deep in our bench. And uh, that's kind of been a a big turnaround. I think there's some leagues around the country where you can afford uh, to really rely on your younger players and still be successful. Uh, that's really difficult in, in, in this league and uh, a lot of other leagues similar to ours. You know, if you're your youngest players, you know, you're at the uh, some of the, the blue blood programs, you can afford to lean on those guys because they're pros. You know, yeah. they're one and done guys. And sometimes you can really uh, sneak one out as far as uh, sneak a talented player out at some uh, in some leagues and some schools around the country and and that guy for it to be one of your real heavy minute guys and and uh, leading score uh again and and uh our league it's it's hard to to uh really rely on uh 18 and 19 year olds to be your best players and heavy minute guys and i it, it's okay to have one uh our first year here we were dressing eight scholarship players and four of them were true freshmen uh, last year, we had one true freshman on the roster. And so all of a sudden, after a while, we just gotten big enough and old enough and uh, athletic enough to, to have a good squad. Your squad had won four in a row before they had two tough losses in Florida last week at Florida Atlantic and FIU. What are the keys now that you're looking to return to this week as you – see UTEP and Texas San Antonio up in Murfreesboro. I know that uh, last week uh, your two opponents shot at a higher percentage than you generally allow. Yeah, you know, first of all, those two teams uh, are doing really well. Uh, They're good. Uh, Dusty May uh, at FAU, those guys are having a really a historic year, you know, yeah. uh, that's, that's one of those you'll remember when, when he's 70, I'm sure that can, we'll look back on and enjoy it. It's, it's hard to in the moment, uh, I'm sure, uh, to really let all that sink in, but having a top 20 team in the country, they haven't lost since November and mm-hmm. their, their team is just a, a veteran group. And similar to our team last year, uh, I've got a, a newcomer in Jalen Gaffney, a transfer from UConn that just, has kind of seamlessly uh, 
integrated himself into a, a veteran roster and man, they are good. And uh, mm-hmm. the place was loud and it's a tough place to go win. Um, you know, they haven't lost at home this year. And then uh, less than really 48 hours later, you go play FIU and uh, Jeremy Ballard's got his team. They, they just play so fast, press you from beginning to end, running up and down from beginning to end. And really when you play that game on the second game of the road trip, you only get that one day in between the two games to prepare for it. You've got two or three day, days leading up to the first game of the road trip to prepare for the FAU game. But then you just get one day on Friday to prepare for Saturday's game. And it is so different than any other game you really play all year. And so it takes a while for your players to, to get used to how that game's going to look and feel and how it's going to the, the flow of the game. And uh, makes them hard to prepare for. So now, obviously, this week we got a homestand. We got two games against UTEP and UTSA, uh, two two really good teams. Uh, you know, you look at uh, with with uh, UTEP, they're four and six in our league, but they've also got four games that have either been one possession games or overtime games. Uh, they lost Whoa. to UAB in double overtime, Rice in overtime, and one possession games uh, and two other games. So pretty easily they could have a very different record in this league. You just get two of them and they would sit at six and four and be in third place. Mm-hmm. Uh, you get them all and you're eight and two and you're in first. And so uh, they're, or excuse me, in second. So uh, although their record may not jump off the page at you, Joe has his team playing really hard and uh, UTSA. I know they've struggled a little bit uh, this year, uh, uh, but they're, they, they did beat us down at UTSA. Yeah. And so, uh, uh, you know, it's going to be a a week that uh, we've got to bounce back because if you want to stay towards the top of your league, and I don't care what league it is, you've got to win home games. And we got two home games this week. Sure. Uh, Defensively, your squads are always uh, looking savvy. And overall, this season allowed opponents to only take 52.5% of of their uh, field goal attempts uh, from that level. And third in Conference USA with a three-point defense at 33.2%. Talk about how your defensive philosophy has allowed you to attack. Yeah, I think just uh, being able to utilize our the, the strengths of our team and our players. Um, mm-hmm. Again, as, as I said earlier, I just think we have pretty good team length and athleticism. So uh, we try not to sit back on our heels and let teams just walk the ball up the floor and, and kind of run what they want. We try to be disruptive uh, with multiple presses throughout the course of the game, uh, be aggressive uh, on the ball right now. Um, before the Florida trip, I don't know the numbers. Uh, I haven't seen them over the last couple of days, but we were right at four on 40% of our defensive possessions. We were either blocking shots or forcing turnovers. Wow. Um, you know, our turnover rate defensively was was uh, uh, around 20. Uh, our, our block shot rate was, uh, you know, in between 15 and 18 percent. So it's just short of 40 percent. Uh, and, and so one thing that we had talked about, though, uh, over the last month was, was that number had kind of been in that range. But when teams were actually shooting the ball, they were making it at too high of yeah. a clip. So we, we needed to improve on our defensive field goal percentage. Like, you know, you're doing a good job of either blocking shots or turning teams over. Uh, but when they're getting clean looks, they're making them at too high of a clip. So we've got to, you know, it, it was kind of a feast or famine. And so we I think we've been a little more solid over the last couple of weeks, although uh, at FIU and FAU, uh, they, they got too many easies over the weekend. But uh, I think our guys have kind of, uh, lock back in over the last couple of practices and hopefully we can uh, get back on track this weekend. Do you guys see as many teams like go to a zone press and then trap the first pass? It seemed like, you know, a few years ago, that was one of the norms. Well, uh, I don't think there's quite as many that are um, as much of a risk taker or gambling as much on defense. Uh, Mm -hmm. There are just so many players these days that can handle the ball and shoot the ball. Uh, uh, You know, 25 years ago when I was in college, you know, I I was in college from 97 to 01, 
you know, most teams run in a three round two offense and uh, you were lucky if your four man could shoot it. Most of the time your five was uh, strictly back to the basket player that uh, wasn't a very good ball handler, couldn't shoot it, was just a very okay passer. And now, you know, some teams, the, the best passer and the best shooter can be the five, you know, yeah. the biggest guy on the floor. So now you can, uh, and really everybody, a lot of teams can run a four guard uh, offensive system. And if not, the, the, the power forward or the so-called four has perimeter skills. So to be able to press those kind of teams uh, becomes difficult when, when almost everybody on the floor has ball skills. They can dribble mm-hmm. it. They can pass it. They're good at catching the ball in traffic. And so uh, pressing all the time and trapping all the time just to turn teams over uh, has become more difficult. Now, there are other reasons to trapping. Uh, change up the tempo of the game. Obviously, forcing turnovers is part of it, but uh, some of it, the, the the other effects can be just forcing the other team to get a little more tired and play a little deeper in their into their bench than they're accustomed to. Uh, get into their practice just a little bit and make them have to prepare for multiple presses so that game prep for your game isn't real easy and vanilla. And so I think there are other reasons other than just turning teams over, but to your point, I don't think uh, you don't see as uh, a ton of trapping and pressing, but also uh, even in the half court, several years ago, uh, ball screen coverage, almost everybody was hard hedging out on the mm-hmm. perimeter. And now mm-hmm. you see a lot of teams that are either uh, uh, kind of soaking what we call a, a soak, uh, a flat mm-hmm. show, or down in the ball screen, ice in it, not letting them use it. Uh, mm-hmm. Just keeps you out of defensive rotations as much uh, with, with the hard hedge you know you're going to have to have be in a defensive rotation. When you're trapping, you know you're going to have to be in defensive rotation. Well, now, it you know, a lot of people just want a hat on a hat, a body mm-hmm. on a body. Stay out of defensive rotation as much as you can because there's so many talented offensive players in the game of basketball these days. Mm-hmm. You've got a really uh, nice roster there. Eli Lawrence leads you in scoring at 12.4 points per game. Uh, he's brought his numbers up. Uh, even since last season when he was a key in your uh, uh, offense and defense? Yeah, Eli's become a more rounded, uh, well-rounded player over the last year or so. Uh, As you mentioned, he was a starter on our team last year, um, but his efficiency numbers have gone up. He he was a he always has been a, a, a good athlete, an active athlete, and can be really disruptive defensively. Uh, he's always been a streaky offensive player. You know, he may mm-hmm. miss five or six in a row, but when he sees one in, go in, uh, sometimes the, the basket immediately gets big for him and mm-hmm. he can reel off three or four in a row. So uh, he's just become uh, more consistent on that end of the floor. Uh, this year, right now in league play anyway, you know, his assist to turnover ratio has been much improved. And that's something that he's concentrated on and worked on over the last couple of years is not just being a, an active athlete that can uh, affect the game with steals and block shots and defensive pressure. And then occasionally heat up on the offensive end, just being a more solid, well-rounded player. And, uh, you know, he's going to be big for us down the stretch. The Andre Dishman will be too. I think it's six, six. I'm thinking he's more of a three or a four as a shooting guard or a power forward. He shoots 52.8% from the floor. Now, I was curious how him and Lawrence make tough matchup for different teams because of their inside-outside abilities and their athleticism. Well, for Dishman, he, he is really our five. Uh, five, he's, okay. he's, Yeah, he's 6'6", six, six, uh, so he gives up height in, in most of our – obviously, in most of our games. Uh, mm-hmm. But at, at he's at about 240 pounds. Uh, really strong and and is able to give us kind of a mismatch at that position. Uh, mm-hmm. uh, he plays uh, on the perimeter some in our our high post look, uh, but uh, because of his ability to score around the basket, he's got good feet, good hands, and uh, although he's not a a three four, he still to your point does provide a, a kind of a, a mismatch problem at times in, in games for us. Uh, he's had uh, some. Good games for us throughout the course of this year. He was big for us last year on that stretch run that you you uh, alluded to earlier as we were heading towards uh, being able to win the CUSA East Championship. And then 
uh, during our Conference USA and CBI tournament runs. He he really was uh, a factor, a dominant factor in those games. And, uh, you know, he's 25 years old. Uh, he's a seventh-year college player. He's been here wow. five years, uh, transferred here from Eastern Kentucky, and uh, has been here five. So he is truly – he's a man. He's he's a 25-year-old man. So uh, having older players, not just older players, but guys that are old in your program, I think is uh, is important. And Lawrence and Dishman are, are certainly that for us. You've got a balanced scoring attack on that perimeter with Cameron Weston and Tiafiel Leonard. They're keys, of course, in starting with Lawrence. Both look for threes, but they also get to the line as well. Yeah, you know, I just think having a, a balanced attack is important. Um, to me, you know, there's some great offensive players out there, but uh, that are hard to stop. There's no doubt about that. But I think when you're uh, more of a balanced attack, there's not just one guy that the other team can key in on uh, to stop you offensively, that they've got to worry about the the hole. And uh, mm-hmm. I, that's what we strive to be. Honestly, I think that's one of the things that makes FAU so difficult to prepare for. Uh, mm-hmm. Their leading score when we played them on Thursday was averaging 12.7. Uh, their fifth leading score, though, was averaging nine. Uh, mm. Three of their top four scores come off the bench. And so no matter who's in the game, they're capable of having a big night. So if you if you have one player who's kind of asleep at the wheel defensively, his man's very capable of having a big night. And that's what we strive to be is to run a system that does, doesn't just focus on getting one person or two people the ball over and over and – those guys have to perform well every night in order for you to to win. Uh, you, you're able to spread the ball around and, and uh, take advantage of other teams. Uh, hopefully, you can find that weak link defensively. Defenses that you see with regard to such a balanced attack and an inside attack that averages 53.1% inside the arc. Well, again, I just think uh, not only balance up and down your roster, but balance uh, inside and out. Uh, Mm -hmm. You know, you don't want – and I've never wanted to be so reliant uh, upon being able to make threes uh, to where if you have an off-shooting night, particularly in tournament play, you have an off-shooting night, your season's over. Uh, You know, you want to be able to find other ways to score the ball. And uh, whether it's getting to the free throw line, uh, getting to the rim, uh, but also the ability to make outside shots. And, uh, you know, there, there are some nights you can see it looks like we may have an advantage on the block, and, and we try to be able to, to go to that. Uh, there are other nights that we've got a couple of shooters that are shooting it into a big basket, and you, you want to utilize that as well. So, uh, again, I, I think uh, if you've uh, – all of a sudden a guy's making a couple of shots in a particular night and – Looks like he's going to have a good night. If if he hasn't really had his number called in weeks, uh, mm-hmm. or really been involved in the offense in weeks, it's to me harder to take advantage of that night for him. Uh, so because he's the third, fourth, or fifth option. So we, uh, again, I just think we we try to as best we can uh, have a balanced attack, and uh, you know make ourselves harder to prepare for and harder to defend. Last thing, Coach, uh, as you look at college basketball, big rumor has been out there, I guess, earlier this you know, this season that potentially a tournament could grow at some point. Is that something that you would be in favor of? And then what would be a good way to do that, in your opinion? You know, I don't know. I, I don't know. I, I go uh, at times I go back and forth, to be honest with you, because uh, we have such a great product right now. Mm-hmm. You oh, know, yeah. uh, it, it, there is a reason why it's called March Madness. There's a reason why so many people tune in uh, mm-hmm. every year. There's the Cinderella story that makes the unexpected run to the to the Sweet 16 and Elite Eight. And, you know, several times over the last two decades, all the way to the final four. And uh, again, you you don't know who that's going to be. So tweaking it, uh, I I wouldn't be totally against it, but Mm -hmm. I I would want to see uh, exactly what that's going to look like. 
you know, mm -hmm. I think being a, 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 inviting everybody to the party uh, would be a mistake. Oh, um, yeah. But over the last uh, couple of decades, there's been more and more uh, teams, programs, universities, athletic departments joining uh, Division One, And uh, we've gone from 64 to 68 teams. And now uh, looking at the percentage of 68 versus the 363 teams that are in Division One is uh, – is a small percentage, you know, uh, but again, uh, earning that's, that's why you have the regular season as well. Uh, you, you've got time to earn yourself in it, but there are a lot of programs that uh, because of the leagues they're in, it, it's going to come down to one week. Mm -hmm. um, but again, for those teams, I think kind of the NCAA tournament has started when the conference tournament starts, you're, you're at win or go home. Mm -hmm. uh, I wouldn't be against, um, uh, expanding it, uh, but I think overexpansion could uh, dilute the product and, and uh, you know, perhaps hurt viewership and uh, the interest level because right now it's, uh, as we all see year in and year out, it's high. I mean, we're playing – each year we play the Final Four in football domes, you know, and there's 75,000, 80,000 people there. So yeah. the, it's, it's – uh, the the product is really really good. If there's a a way to make it even better, I'm all for it. Uh, mm -hmm. I think being stagnant is not good. Uh, you know, fear of change uh, just because it's change, uh, I don't think is good. If you could change the product to something better, uh, then that'd be great. Because again, yeah. we've got a a great product right now. Coach Nick McDevitt, ladies and gentlemen, the Blue Raiders of Middle Tennessee. Coach, it's been a pleasure talking to you once again. I wish you the best going through the season, and thanks uh, for your time today. Thank you very much. Appreciate you having me.